I'm, I'm doing a symposium at the Council on National Policy on uh, ballot harvesting. I've, I've become an expert, apparently, on this. <laughs> But years ago, they wanted to try to do that, and, and uh, they wanted to see if they could mobilize churches. And, and I, was, I always said, it's just never going to happen. People aren't going to part with their ballot. It's sacred to them. Well, then when we see you know, all the shenanigans happening, it's like, okay, we're in. And people <laughs> voluntarily bring their ballots. And, and it's, it was very effective in the last election. We're going to do it again. And we're not breaking any rules. These are the rules they set up. We're going to play by them. So um, that's how we do it. <clears throat> Uh, so yesterday I had the privilege to, I, that's, I think it's the first time I've ever done it. I spoke at a women's conference. <laughs> yeah, I, I felt the same way. Yeah, I got the same response, basically, that I got here. But it was at the uh, Angelus Temple, which is um, in Echo Park down in L.A. It was uh, kind of the, the central hub of Amy Simple McPherson, who started the Foursquare Church. Um, and then she faked her own death and tried to run off with her lover. Interesting. Christianity has some really strange characters involved in it. Uh, we put the fun and dysfunction in Christianity. So, uh, but, but it was a it was a great uh, conference, and uh, they were they were uh, encouraging these these women to be mama bears, you know, to protect their kids, and especially in the state of California. And and so the speakers, I, I enjoyed listening to all of them. <clears throat> it was a great time, and. Uh, and I, I, I had shared uh, at the luncheon, and then I was one of the speakers in the main event. And at the end of it, two people came up um, and, and wanted to ask my statistics and where I got them and, and asking, you know, all that stuff. And I was listening to them. It was almost like I was, I was uh, being grilled or, you know, challenged. And, and both of them have their kids in uh, public schools in the LA Unified School District. And I just said, you know, um, in the next session, you're going to you're gonna see all the things you're asking for because uh, Pastor Mark did one and he brings up all the headlines, he brings up all the bills and the Senate bills and, and all the governor's edicts and all those things. And I said, so you'll see that. So when you see that, my question would be uh, to you is, are you more apologetic for the secular left than you are with standing for truth? And, and, and I said, let me just ask you, you know, because the Bible commands this and you, you said it to me, I, I'm not saying to you, you're a professing Christian, um, and the education of the children doesn't, God's not going to hold your teachers accountable. He's going to hold us accountable as stewards of their lives. The children have been entrusted to us, not the state. And I, I said, can you please tell me what the Ten Commandments are that you're supposed to know and instruct your children on? Silence. Yeah, silence, which is, and that was the case with the entirety of the room. And of course, I walked them through the Ten Commandments and, you know, taught them how to do it with the hand signals and all that. <clears throat> but... I just said, you know, we, 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 we make apologies for the left instead of standing up upon the truth because we're, we're, we're more concerned with being liked than we are with being true. And, and they, they receive that to their credit. And, it, and I'm watching an awakening occur across the country. It's kind of exciting. And I, I, uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't seek to be offensive, but at times I am. Uh, it's a gift. You know, it's a... <laughs> so... But but I but it was just it was speaking the truth in love, um, and it was it, it was it was a, a very profitable day in that regard, and I was very encouraged by what I witnessed and and thankful for the work that folks are doing. And I was asked because they had heard me speak at uh, Che On's church in Pasadena, and the person who heads up this event at the last minute said, "Will you come and share these principles to the ladies?" I said, "Yeah, sure." So I, I did it, and um, and so it was it was helpful. It's also been an interesting week in that, I don't know if you've been tracking the news, but the President of the United States has been found incompetent to stand trial, mentally incompetent to stand trial for, for hoarding classified material in his garage. Um, I'm wondering, oh, that's interesting, and yet he's still competent to lead the United States. It's, <laughs> so um, we, we, that's, that's an interesting deal there. And... Um, and all of this in the midst of it, you, you sometimes get a little discouraged. And you think, well, you know, is there any hope? And, and there always is. And, and this, is, this is one of those moments in time where I, I'm getting more and more excited. Because the odds seem so overwhelming. That's when the Lord really loves to work. Because he gets all the glory in relation to that. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, amen. And, and then, you know, in the Anchored Reading series, uh, I, 
I was so excited about doing kind of a Reader's Digest version of one of my favorite characters in the scripture, second only to King David, is um, Joseph. Not Joseph and Mary, but Joseph, the son of Jacob, the 12th of his 13 kids. And, uh, and the reason why I like it so much is because <clears throat> this is a man that really had no reason to hope, and yet he always did. This is a man who had every reason to give up, yet never did. This is a, a man that you just can't see how any of this is going to work together for good, yet it does. And it, it's one of those stories, you know, we, we, we love, um, like, well, before Disney went woke, we, we loved all the, the stories, where, because it, and they lived happily ever after. You know, there's a tagline at the end. And we, we love clean stories that wrap up nicely with, and they lived happily ever after. And, and truly, the, the life of Joseph is, and they lived happily ever after. It's, it's one of the most fascinating stories, true, by the way, uh, in, in all of history. Um, and it is a happily ever after story. There's, there's, there's some cool things to it. And I want to show those to you before we stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. I want to show you, just so you're intrigued about what we're going to take a look at. And, and we're going to fly over these passages. We're not... We're not going to be walking through them or riding a bike or driving a car. We're flying over them. So um, please put your tray tables up. <laughs> I don't know what it's doing. So happily ever after, the story of happily ever after includes a doting father, a pampered son, jealous brothers, an international food crisis, intrigue, attempted murder and betrayal, accusations of rape, forgotten prisoner, redemption, and restoration. And here's the coolest thing of this story. From this story, God builds a hero, God saves a family, and God creates a nation that will in turn bless the whole world. So Joseph's life is pretty remarkable, and uh, it's worthy of your investment. So if you don't have a Bible, these folks walking down will give you one. If you do have a Bible, open up to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. Once everybody has their Bible... There we go. Hands are raised in the middle here. And by the way, if you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to keep that one. If you want to hold out when we run out of those, we've got some really cool leather ones that will be given out later. You can exchange them if you don't want to wait. Genesis 37. All right. Let's stand for the reading of the word of the Lord, please. I'll read out loud if you'll follow along silently. I'm going to begin at verse 1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them, to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please, hear this dream which I have dreamed. There, were, uh, there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Lord, we ask your blessing on the study of your word as we take a look at the life of Joseph. Not only is he hated by his brothers, but they would simply betray him and fake his death. And then his life would be a series of tragedy and then yet, God, even in the midst of it, you work it together for good. And yet, Lord, I pray that as we examine Joseph's life, we see ours in his, that we would be willing to avail ourselves to you and say, Lord, you search me and you know me and there be any wicked way, Lord, please cleanse me of all unrighteousness that I would forget what is behind, strive for what is ahead and taking hold of that for which you've taken hold of me. Lord, I pray that there would be an accounting done today that our lives would be given to you afresh. And Lord, I pray for all who are present and even those who are tuning in from all around the globe that you would minister deeply to each and every one in the hearing of my voice. And I pray, Lord, your word would bring that bomb of Gilead 
that we'd heal those wounds, that there'd be repentance and forgiveness, and Lord, there'd be restoration. So God, work it all together for good. We trust you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll have a seat if you would. <clears throat> Jacob, the father of Joseph, um, Joseph is, what, 12 of 13 or 11 of 12? 12, 12 of 13, anyways. Yeah, 12 of 13. And he's, at this point, he's the youngest of, of the kids. Benjamin would be coming later. And yet he is, he's the child of Rachel, which is Jacob's second wife. Now they had two handmaids, so that's where you saw Zilpah and Bilhah. Those are handmaids. So some of the children were born through the handmaid. Um, but Jacob, his first wife was Leah, and his second wife was Rachel. Rachel and Leah were the daughters of Laban. Laban was, um, he, he was quite a character. He, he couldn't get rid of his oldest daughter, Leah. Um, and, and for those women here named Leah, um, this doesn't apply to you. <laughs> Sincerely. Uh, the character of her life would, but not the meaning of her name. In the scriptures, it says that Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. She, she was a hottie. And then it says, Leah had cow's eyes. Better translated, one who made your eyes hurt. She fell out of the ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. <laughs> and she was the oldest sister, and, and Laban couldn't marry her to anyone. But Jacob worked to marry Rachel, and then on the night that they were to consummate the marriage, Laban switched Leah with Rachel, and they wore similar to what would be a burqa, and then when the marriage was consummated and the veil was removed, this group says, behold, it was Leah. It was like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I love scripture. It just doesn't hold anything back. And then he, he didn't have to work another seven years for Rachel. He gave, it, gave Rachel to him in advance, but he still had to work the seven years, but he still got to have her and didn't have to wait another seven years. So now he's married to two women, and one he is smitten with and attracted to, and the other is just baggage. And, and Leah's life is one of heartache because every time she gives birth to a son, her statement basically is, now maybe my husband will love me. Yeah, it's really sad. And son after son, maybe he'll love me now, maybe he'll pay attention to me now, maybe, maybe, maybe. And finally, she gives birth to Judah. And, and she says, you know what? I'm, I'm done seeking the favor of man. I'm just gonna praise God. And Judah's name means praise, praise God. Well, of all the sons of Jacob, of all the tribes of Israel, Judah is the one that Jesus' lineage comes through. Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and, and it's from Leah that, um, that this name is echoed in the halls of heaven. Christ is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And of course, we know that when Jacob died, Jacob is Joseph's father, we know that when Jacob died, he didn't want to be buried next to Rachel, he wanted to be married next to Leah, because he came to love her and, and realized that she was a woman of substance, of character. Whereas Rachel was pretty on the outside, but just ugly on the inside. As a matter of fact, when she was giving birth to her last son, Benjamin, who was younger than Joseph, she said, name him Benoni, son of my sorrow. You make sure he lives every day of his life responsible for my death, because she died in childbirth. And then Jacob says, no, we're going to call him Benjamin, Benami, which means son of my right hand, my little right hand man. And, and, and it was there that Jacob realized that Rachel's, she's pretty on the outside, but she's ugly on the inside. It's kind of like a seized chocolate. You just, you take a bite and you're like, uh, uh. that one. And you, you get a mixed, you know, box and you start to know which ones you don't. You leave those for your siblings. Like, no, no, that's a good one. You know, it's like marzipan. You're like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> maybe that didn't happen in your family. I was the youngest. That's all that was left to me. I like marzipan. <laughs> So, so Joseph is, is born to Jacob in his old age, and uh, he, he loves this kid. There's just something special about him. And the older you get, the more you, you love little young ones around you. And, and he's just, there's, there's hope in this next child. And, and, and all of his brothers, you know, the youngest is always picked on. Michelle and I are the youngest in our families. I mean, we just, and, and they're the ones that always surprise you. 
because you know you just you, you you never give them the time of day and and all they're doing is just sitting back and watching you step on the landmines. I watched that with my brother. I'm like, no, 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 you're you're super important. You're the favored one. You, you do that. Boom. <laughs> I'm not stepping there. And you just you just calculate and remember those things, and then you just you just don't make those mistakes. And 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 that was kind of Joseph. He's just sitting back and watching his brothers. But Joseph was a dreamer. And and he, he was favored by his father, which creates a problem. Because if, if you don't practice, you know, not showing your hand to the kids you're kind of you like more than the others. It's kind of like when you're on Southwest Airlines, maybe you haven't been there, but you get a funny attendant and they go, you know, first put your mask on and then take care of your children's mask. And if you have twins, pick the one with the most potential. I always thought that was a great line. I'm like, I'll do you first. You know, it's like, well, in this case, uh, Jacob would be putting the mask on Joseph while the other 11 would be scrambling for theirs. And, 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 and he favored him. And the other kids realized that. And they, they, they were embittered to him. Well, Jacob makes it worse. He gives his son, the, the, the definition in Hebrew, at first it says in the English translation, it says a coat of many colors. We heard Dolly Parton sing that song. And it's a better translation. Coat of many colors means it's a regal robe, and it also had it means a, a coat of big sleeves. So it's, it's a robe that's very um, decorated, and, it, and it's formal attire. It's it's a white collar outfit. It's like a business suit, as opposed to blue collar, where you know you got a shirt with your name on it, and you're you're going to go get greasy. Uh, and and the and the boys were all laborers. Well, Joseph gets a white collar outfit. He, he gets to walk around and be an observer and see if the work's doing well. And he's, you know, he's now kind of a boss. And now they're really embittered to him because you know, they're out there laboring. He's walking around in this regal robe as you know, little, little prince. And now, now they're seriously embittered. And, and to make matters worse, he, he, he doesn't have a filter. And, and God speaks to him in dreams, and he's, he's going to continue to speak to Joseph in dreams, but he doesn't realize that there's some people you don't share what God's telling you to. And so he goes right to his brothers. He goes, I had a dream. I was a sheep standing up straight, and you were all bowing down at my feet. <laughs> and you're like, I'm going to kill you. And that wasn't the only, he had two of those dreams describing himself as lording over the other brothers. And that's the youngest. The youngest has to pay the price to exist. You know, you, you, if you get any food, you, it's because we've given it to you. And that's because we're full. I've been there. I know. And, and this, is, this is Joseph. He's, he's walking around in this coat, and he's the youngest, and he hasn't earned his stripes, and he's telling them they're all going to be bowing down to him. And at this point, they, they hated him and could not speak peaceably with him. And now, now they want to kill him. And it gets worse. After this dream that we studied in the previous passage, it now comes to verse 18 of the same chapter. Now, when they saw him afar off as he's walking towards the brothers, they see him afar off, and even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. And the story's involved, and they were going to kill him, but it was Judah who said, let's not kill him, let's just imprison him, and we'll put him in the pit, and we'll, de we'll decide what we're going to do later. And they ultimately end up saying, let's sell him into slavery and pretend that he died. And Judah basically saved his life. They came near and they conspired to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come therefore, let us kill him and cast him into some pit and we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. We're done with this kid. I mean, they are, imagine that. They're so embittered to this young man because of, of, of him spouting off his dreams and walking around in a colored robe that they want to kill him. Siblings can be a bit brutal, can't they? Some of you are the oldest, you're going, no, no, we're all really, we're really good. Yeah, the, the order in a family is difficult. Well, Judah stands up for him in one sense, but still allows him to be sold into slavery, which isn't a good thing. And these Midianites, traitors, they come by. And so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. So then they took Joseph's tunic and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the tunic in blood. And then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, we found this, 
Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. And then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and a captain of the guard. Potiphar is the head of Pharaoh's secret service. He's also part of, I guess, his death squads, or he's in charge of of prisoner um, capital punishment, execution of prisoners. This guy is not one to be messed with. And, And the Ishmaelites sell him to Potiphar. Now he is a slave in Potiphar's household. Ha. What, what, a, what, a, what an awful thing to do. They conspired together, kept the secret for the, for the lifetime, almost to the deathbed of their father, that he would live every day missing his son, believing him to be dead. They saw the anguish in their father, but because they so wanted to protect their fortunes and their identity and their position in the order, in the pecking order, they allowed their father to go through that misery. Who, who does that? Now I ask that, and some of you can answer it. And, and, and in a room this capacity, they're, they're, and, and even through the internet, there's, there's folks who say, well, I, I, I know, or I'm guilty. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You, you've, you've, some people have wished ill on, on those that they're, they're called to be family to. And love. There's division within a family. There's bitterness. I find it strange that I run into people they, they just, they just can't forgive. And then, and then to watch the heartache of your parents through the course of this, and the pain associated with it. This man's mourning for the entirety of his life, losing his youngest child who he adored. And all of them are conspired together and don't even, don't even whisper of it. And what's to happen to, to Joseph? He's sold into slavery. He's lost his family. He's, he's lost his people. He's in a foreign land of the language of which he doesn't speak, and he's placed in the household of a man to be feared. Seems all has been lost. He's been sold for 20 pieces of silver and betrayed by his family. I, I don't know about you, but that... That's just an absence of hope. I think there's folks probably in the room and in the the viewing of the message that you're at a place where there doesn't seem like there's any hope. It wasn't that long ago in the midst of COVID when Dr. Robert Levin the health officer of the county was, in my estimation, making my life a living hell, and, and all of ours. I was brought before the judge in contempt charges. Every time we opened the doors of the church, we were facing $3,000 in fines. We amassed hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. All while his winery was kept open. I was, I was embittered to this man. He, 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 he bothered me. He made me angry. And in the midst of the most critical time when I didn't know whether, whether or not I'd, I'd, I'd be able to stay out of prison, my, my daughter in the third trimester of being pregnant with our grandson, Theodore, Theodore Elkin, he, my grandson died. Oh, the, the strain and the stress in the third trimester, that's a little baby. He was, he was just couple weeks from being born he died they they didn't want to tear his body apart they they wanted to go through the birthing process and say goodbye to their their little boy their son of course we weren't permitted to be there because of the draconian measures that had been placed upon the entire county we we couldn't find a hospital that would, would would do the stillbirth save but for one obscure hospital in Santa Paula in the northern regions on the outskirts of Ventura County. And they agreed to 
to deliver the baby that the, the baby would be born and they'd get to say goodbye. I remember the burial of little Theodore. It was a sad day. I lost a lot of hope that day. Hopefully you couldn't see it, but the sermons were difficult to get through. Everyone was looking to you for answers and direction. I may, may be able to share the words of truth, but my heart was suffering. Those are those moments where you just wonder, why do I have to be here? I had, I had longed to give up the pulpit three or four years ago and get a drink with an umbrella on a beach somewhere. And then COVID hit. And listen, the last thing I wanted to do, and I was, I was telling the ladies this yesterday, I go, you know, you're all tired. And I, I said, I'm just like you. I, I, I want it to all go away. I, I'd, I'd like, I mean, the largest voting block in America is evangelical Christians, 65 to 85 million of them, but only half are registered to vote. And of the half to vote, uh, of the half that are registered to vote, only half of those vote. And that's in a presidential election. It's half of that in a non-presidential. 11%, it's pathetic. Compare that to the LGBTQ+, it's like 95% voter turnout and registration. Because Christians just want it to go away. We, we don't want to get into the dirty details of life. And you certainly don't want to stand in opposition to authority. I didn't either. None of us did. It wasn't easy. And especially when your friends in the body of Christ feel as though what you're doing is wrong. I didn't like it. I still don't like it. But that's irrelevant. It's, it's called the consequences of truth. I'm not going to stand idly by while they demand that our children be injected with some experimental mRNA vaccine, quote unquote vaccine. It's anything but. The only vaccine I know that can't stop you from getting the thing that they say that prevents you from getting. And now we have, what, 28% increase in death rate in Ventura County? I wonder what's caused that. And, and look, I, I don't like to be vilified by, by every left organization and, and death threats because we're standing for the simple truth that there's two genders. Somehow that is a capital offense and, and you are worthy of death. I don't like it either. And it, and it puts you in a season where it almost seems like, what's the point? Is, is anyone getting this? A lot of you are going, wow, this guy's out of control. <laughs> or for those of you who are unfamiliar with my teaching style, <laughs> we're going to pick it up at the end. But the truth is, there were seasons where it was that dark. And there are times even now where I got to fight through what I call the black dog. Just barks. I heard from Michelle because she has to live through it. Is you know, everything okay? No. And the Lord is good. And Joseph is sold into Potiphar's house. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there and the Lord was with Joseph and he was success, a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. Here a pagan who is polytheistic is recognizing in Joseph that God, who he doesn't believe in, is with him. That boy has a work ethic. It's interesting that Christians don't. If you have an ichthus on your business card, it's probably because you don't have a work ethic. No offense to those of you who do and do have a work ethic. I'm saying to every rule, there's an exception. But if you have to tell me you're a Christian to get business as opposed to proving you're a Christian by your work ethic, I've been, I've been stung more with that ichthus. You know what ichthus is? It's that fish symbol. Oh, Christian. 
They stole everything from me. What you're, I can't hear what you're saying because what you're doing speaks so loudly. Your faith is, is revealed by the way in which you work. Work is a form of worship to the Lord. Joseph worked hard. God showed him favor. You know, he went, why are you late for work? You know, I was totally, I was totally reading the scriptures and I just felt the Lord just telling me to just kind of just spend time with him. That's why I'm late, boss. So, you know, yeah, that's, you're, 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 you're taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. You're, you're applying your, your, your laziness to spirituality. This, this, he was young and, and he, was, he was handsome in form and appearance. And this kid was chiseled. This kid, seriously, he, had, he was ripped. He just walked around with one of those faces and those eyes that just, you know, if he was Scottish, he'd be McDreamy. He was just the guy. And, and, and he, he, he just, he rises in, in, in importance in Potiphar's house because his work ethic, everything he touches goes well. You know what luck comes from? Hard work. You're lucky. No, you, you work hard. And you get opportunities. And Joseph found favor, verse four, in his sight and served him. And then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had, he put under his authority. Verse five through nine, so it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. And thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, McDreamy. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and she said, lie with me. And if you don't know what lie with me means, you're an idiot. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master doesn't know, uh, does not know what is with me in the house and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in his house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? This is a, this is a solid kid. You know what character is? What you do when no one's looking? Because you're accountable to God. And, and here, this, this, this is a young man's dream. A cougar. In this case, it'd be a saber tooth, but it was a cougar. And she's like, I'd like to play braille on that washboard stomach. <laughs> And, 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 you know, the four most intense drives of a male his age is air, water, food, and sex. And, and air, you can go, what, five minutes without it? Water, maybe three days. Food, maybe 40. You can live without sex, but most men would give up food, water, and hold their breath. <laughs> right? And, and when you're struggling with sexual sin, that's when you fast because you bring that into alignment with the purposes of God. You want to get right with God. Temptation isn't a sin. It's a call to, to, to war. It's a call to action. No temptation sees you, but that which is common to man, when you're being tempted, God will give you a way out. And, and he, he just says, look, I, I, I'm in charge of all this, and you're forbidden. And I can't do this before God. It's a sin against God. Regardless of how you feel about it, regardless of, of your lack of morality, I'm not doing it. My, my flesh may be attracted, but I, I, I'm not doing this. I'm letting you know that. She's persistent. She doesn't stop. Ultimately, she tears his clothes off him. He runs out naked. He could get over here, man. Oh, oh. And he's just running, just running, just, just running. And she, she says, he tried to rape me. Huh. All things work together for good with those who love God. Really? He didn't commit rape. He didn't sin against God. He honored his master. His wife was a brazen hussy. 
She tried to entice him. He didn't fall prey to it. And he's accused of rape and then thrown into prison. I think it was Corey Tenboom who said, God, it's a wonder why you have any friends the way you treat them. Corey wrote that in a season of her life where she was struggling with her faith. Corey Tenboom um, had hidden Jews in her house in Nazi Germany or in the Nazi territories. And they put her in a concentration camp. Her and her sister Betsy, her father, died there. And her and Betsy snuck a New Testament into Ravensbrück concentration camp. And they began to host Bible studies in their barracks. And they, they called it the barracks that had hope. And they talk about a God of forgiveness and they would, they would do Bible studies every night with the small text that they had snuck in. And they were preparing men and women who were facing eternity as their temporal lives were coming to a close, as many would be gassed and incinerated, they were sharing with them the hope beyond the grave. And they did that every night. They brought hope to a realm where there seemed to be none. Betsy was older than Corey. Betsy was the one who had the faith. Betsy would encourage her sister Corey to close every night in prayer in accordance with the word of God. Give thanks in all things. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so Betsy would go down the list of all the things she was thankful for. Thankful that they had the scriptures, thankful that they had the Bible studies. And as they're going down this list, they're itching incessantly with the lice that have invaded their bodies and the open wounds, the persistent cough that they all seem to have in this concentration camp, their emaciated bodies, their growling stomachs of hunger, And as Betsy's going down the list, Corey's eyes are rolling as she's just so disgusted by Betsy's attempt to find hope where there wasn't any. And she finally lost it with her sister when Betsy when when Betsy said, Lord, and thank you for the lice. And Corey just, she'd had enough. She said, I'm done. Thanking God for the lice. Are you, are you, are you insane? And there was a rift between the two. And then shortly after that, Betsy would die at the hands of a German guard. Corey's faith was shook to the foundation. She struggled in a time of hopelessness, similar to what this man's struggling with. He's accused of rape that he didn't commit. This woman wanted to cheat on her husband. Sexual sin is a way that that God wants to take down you young people. It'll immediately affect you in your character. Sex is an expression of intimacy, both physical, emotional, and spiritual. It's intended for marriage because you've connected on every level. But if sex is self-gratification, then you're just using another individual with no purpose of, of honoring God and seeking to raise a family and be a covering for that person. You're taking from them something that doesn't belong to you. There's no fidelity It's just using one another and and diminishing the significance of of, of of the sacred marital bond. And if you're married and and you're tempted, maybe you're acting like Potiphar's wife. Maybe maybe you've engaged, and, and I hate the word, but most people relate to it, an affair, which is adultery. And and you 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 you've you're You know the man's married if you're a woman, and you think, well, he's gonna leave his wife for me. Less than 10% do. You're just being used, and vice versa. For the man, you're you're ruining your family. In the book, A Fair Proof Your Marriage by Lana Staheli, those who leave their spouses to marry a lover is only 10%, and 70% of those who do end up divorcing their lover. Of the 25 to 30% that stay married to their lover, only 50% of them are happy. You're wasting your time and destroying everything you love because you have fallen prey to Potiphar. I, I, I don't know what you think is, is awaiting you, but you, you, have, you, have, you have bought into the lie. That, that bait was dangled and you've been hooked and you're about to be filleted. Sin is pleasurable for a season, but the end therein is death. Your kids don't know 
who to trust. They, they, they don't know what it means to have a, a, a family that has foundation that they can count on because you have no character. And yet Joseph, and, and I say this to the young people, I don't know what family you came from, but could it be any worse than Joseph's? The, 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 the chapter, it goes 37 that we began in, we jumped to 39 because 38 is about Judah sleeping with his daughter-in-law. And she portrayed herself as a prostitute. The, the, these brothers were messed up. So you young people, if you're gonna use your parents as an excuse to delve into misery, you're, you're, you're part of the problem. You don't get to pick the parents you get in this world, but you can pick the kind of parents you're gonna be. Look, I'm sorry you got gypped, but God's calling you to prepare your life as Joseph did, regardless of if you've been abandoned or betrayed for 20 pieces of silver, it doesn't matter. God's got, a, God's got a life ahead of you if you but keep your eyes on him. It's a process of the refiner's fire and every great man or woman of God goes through a desert experience. God's teaching you to wait upon him and trust him. And there are times where you wonder where he is. I went through that. They throw him into prison for a rape he didn't commit because he stood upon the principles of God to honor the man who employed him, whose wife lied to him. And now he's thrown into prison. Two of the folks that are in prison, a butler and a baker, and I, I wonder how they got, got into prison. Bad pastry? I don't know. But they're languishing in prison. They both have these awful dreams. And Joseph, who gets dreams and knows about dreams, interprets both dreams. And, and, and to one, he says to, to uh, the, the baker, you're going to die. And to the butler, he says, you're going to live. That's what the dream interprets. And I, he says to the butler, remember me when you're restored to your position. Genesis 40 now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and the chief baker among his servants, and then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. He's still sitting there languishing. God, where are you? What have I done to, to receive such silence and misery from you? Nowhere in the scripture do you read that about Joseph's life. That's why he is so amazing to me. I met young people with that kind of character. God's got special things in store for them. And in the midst of this, while he's languishing in prison, wondering, maybe as I would, where are you, God? Pharaoh, like the butler and the baker, has a dream. And this dream is seven fat calves are eaten by seven skinny cows. Seven fat cows are eaten by seven skinny cows. And he wakes up and he goes, what is that? He had bad Egyptian pizza. What is that? <laughs> and it's the butler who says, the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my faults to this day when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream and one night he and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream and now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass just as he interpreted for us. So it happened, he restored me to my office, and he hanged the baker. And Pharaoh's like, go get him. Go get him. And Joseph shows up with Pharaoh, and he tells him the dream, and he says, the dream is from the Lord, and it means that Egypt is going to have seven years of plenty and seven years of famine following it. And my advice to you is in the seven years of plenty, take a fifth of the crop and store it, and you'll survive through the famine of the other seven years. 
So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the spirit is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there's no one as discerning and wise as you. You, you shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And they lived happily ever after. That would be enough of restoration right there. You're in charge of all, all of Egypt. I, I'm still the king, but you're in charge of all of it. Wow. Gosh, Lord. You know, God doesn't finish halfway. He who began a good work is faithful to complete it. Joseph is looking like an Egyptian. And he's just got that headdress thing, too uncommon looking. Got the... He's wearing the breastplate and all that stuff. Walking around like Yul Brenner. <laughs> Young people are like, who? <laughs> and all of a sudden the famine hits after the seven years of plenty and their storehouses are full. It's an international food crisis. And, and the Hebrews, Jacob's family, the tribes, they're out of food. So they have to travel to Egypt because they hear there's food there. And, and Joseph sees them coming. They have no idea who he is because he looks like an Egyptian. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and he begins to inquire of them and ask them questions that seem personal as though he'd Googled them. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the Tucker interview with Vladimir Putin. He's, he's, he's sitting across from Tucker and he says, you know, and he's talking about the CIA and the KGB and... He says, you know, Tucker, I, knew that, I know that you were preparing to go into the CIA. And, and, and Tucker's like, like, this guy's done his homework. He gives an entire history of Russia from the 8th century. I mean, the guy's brilliant. You're like, and Tucker's met his match in that interview. I thought it was kind of cool. It's almost two hours long. Well, he's asking questions that are personal. That How does he know this about us? Is he so discerning? And what he's doing is he's testing them. He's testing them. He wants to see if they have fixed the fracture in the family, if they've, if they've gotten any character since his departure. They're assuming he's dead. They're, they're assuming he died in prison. They, they all agreed not to tell dad, but we've got to hold this family together. And the way that they're treating Benjamin, the youngest, and the things that they're doing, it, 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 it appears as though they have repented of, 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 of the way that they acted to him. And after he's taken them through a series of tests... And the Bible says, bear fruit in accordance with repentance. You may be one of the folks in the room today and there's sin in your life and you're hearing a story of forgiveness so you're gonna turn to the person you've offended and say, you need to forgive me. <laughs> you need to bear fruit in accordance with repentance. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I can forgive and put the consequences of your actions in the hands of the Lord, but if you want me to trust you, you're going to have to build that because you've broken it. He's testing to see if he can trust them. You betrayed me for 20 pieces of silver, and he walks them through the iterations, and he sees them passing the test. And finally, after their second visit, he just can't do it anymore. And the scripture says, and Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. And then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer for they were dismayed in his presence. He's going to kill us. What we've done to him. You can't be Joseph. You're, you're dead. He's like, I'm your brother. Where, is dad alive? And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near. And then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. You sold me into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you preserve, to preserve life. God took what Satan intended for evil and he used it together for good. 
He's sovereign. He, he works all things together for good. I don't know how he does it, but he does. And as a result of your actions, and I was placed in prison, and Potiphar's wife threw me under the bus and backed over me, and then the butler forgot me and then remembered, and then Pharaoh brought me in, and God gave him a dream, and now I'm sitting over all this, and I interpret it, and we got to save food, and you guys are hungry, and we've been able to save our family. God is so good. Amen. What about Theodore, Lord? How's that good? What about lice? And we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Michelle and I cried that day we buried that little boy. It got worse. Dr. Judy's, Mikevitz's husband, David, he died. He had COPD and he got pneumonia and he died. And they had the audacity to say he died from COVID. He already had the antibodies. Infuriating. So frustrating. Bobby Kennedy Jr. paid for the autopsy to prove he didn't die from COVID. And they were just messing with my sister because she has stood opposed to all this nonsense from day one and they want to just make a mockery of her. And I'm supposed to look out for the widow and the orphan. And I'm, I'm frustrated by this. And we've got a lawsuit with the, the county and and we've lost at every juncture, and now we're going to the Supreme Court, and we've got some sympathy from some of the judges. We're, we're feeling as though this case may be taken. And I'm listening to Judy just share about David, and I'm just so frustrated. And the Lord reminds me a little Theodore. You see, the day that he was delivered... As painful as that day was for my daughter and my son-in-law and for Michelle and me and all of his little siblings, we took great comfort in the care that they received at that little hospital in Santa Paula. It was a mother-daughter doctor team, loved on Molly and Micah. They got to pray with little Theodore and everybody wept and the nurses too and it was a testimony to life even though the baby was dead. And that mother-daughter doctor team, so compassionate. Their last name was Levin. It was Dr. Levin's wife and daughter. The man responsible for my greatest misery, responsible for my greatest comfort. And then it clicked. And I picked up the phone and I called Jeff Gurrell, who had just gotten elected to the supervisory board by all your efforts. And I said, can you get me a meeting with Dr. Levin? And he said, no, you're in a lawsuit with the county. I can't do it. And I said, okay. How about if I drop the lawsuit? He says, I can't promise anything, but that would really help. So in faith, I dropped something I'd worked very hard for. And they'd offered us hundreds of thousands of dollars. We bypassed that to pursue the lawsuit, and now we're gonna drop it. And I dropped the lawsuit. And to his credit, he got that meeting with Dr. Levin. We sat in a cafe over in Camarillo and I sat across from him. And this is a man that I did not like. But he's not my enemy. He's my opportunity. And I told him the story about his wife and his daughter and my daughter and my son-in-law and my little grandson. We both were choked up. I came to realize he's not a monster. I took the autopsy and I put it on the table and I said, Dr. Levin, this isn't a quid pro quo, but in my calling, in my ordination, I'm to, call, I'm to care for the widow and the orphan and I've got a widow whose character's been besmirched and I want to resolve it and get this death certificate amended. As you'll see in the autopsy, he didn't die from COVID. Can you help me? 
He says, Rob, I can't do it, but I'll, I'll try to find out who can. And he personally contacted the attending physician and they amended the death certificate. Amen. Now, yeah. now that's no Joseph story, but to me it was life-changing. It was part of the community in which we live and we endure, we endeavor. Corey Ten Boom set that example for me to endeavor through those times where there doesn't seem to be hope because the story she shares about her sister and their, her crisis of faith and an unwillingness to praise God for lice, watching her sister die at the hands of a German guard. In obedience, but in an emptiness in her heart, she agreed as God had prodded her to go back to Germany after the war to preach a gospel of forgiveness. Is that just cruel or what? And in obedience to the Lord, she goes back to war-torn Germany to preach a gospel of forgiveness to the people who were responsible for her pain. In a bombed out German beer hall late one night in a cold German winter, she gives this gospel of hope and forgiveness and no one comes forward but one man and in the dimly lit beer hall, the light shines upon his face and immediately she recognizes him as the one who killed her sister. And all she has is anger and unforgiveness and bitterness to the man. And her hands are in her pockets and, and, and the only coat she possesses as she's shivering and, and the, the, the shivering is, is a result of, of the anger that she's experiencing as he's walking towards her. And he says to her, you speak of a God of forgiveness and the things I'm responsible for, I know they've affected you. He didn't know who she was, but she knew who he was. But just like Joseph's brothers, he owned up to what he had done. And he says, I know God can forgive me if you will forgive me. And he puts his hand out. And she let it dangle there in the cold German night with no desire to grasp his hand. She had nothing but hatred for him. And in the confusion of her soul and the heartache of loss, in the desert of despair, she just said, God, if I put my hand forward, you're going to have to supply the emotion. I'll do it in obedience. She, seemed, she said it seemed like an eternity, but she pulled her hand out of her coat and extended it to the man. And they touched hands and began to weep. And forgiveness was established and hearts were healed. And she told him who he was to her. He wept even more, asked for her forgiveness, which she extended it was cathartic for her own soul. He said, I know of you. I know of your sister. You were the barracks of hope. We knew you had Bible studies there, but we never went in because we were afraid of the lice. God's not finished with your story yet. Don't give up. And if you're responsible like Joseph's brothers were for the heartache, go and reconcile. Get it right. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver by a disciple. He endured the Via Dolorosa, the way of pain, to pay for your sin, that he would forgive you of all unrighteousness. And he who's been forgiven much loves much. It's time to reconcile and make it all better. Clean up your side of the street. Fix it up. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your forgiveness. God, in a moment as we um, will spend time worshiping you, the God who's made this day possible, whose story of redemption you orchestrated from the dawn of time in the life of a faithful man, Joseph. Lord, we see ourselves throughout that story. We find it similar to our own. And we know as you spoke to Joseph and to his brothers, you're speaking to us now. And we wanna do business with you. We wanna make it right. We wanna reconcile. And so, Lord... I pray that you'd give every man and woman who needs it the opportunity and the ability as you gave Corey to act upon that faith to find forgiveness and healing. 
I pray that you would do that work that only you can do, Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would just do a mighty work this day in the lives of all who are present in the hearing of my voice. For those that don't have the ability from far away to come forward for prayer and to be encouraged and prayed over by another person, Lord, as a fellowship that does have that privilege, we're thankful for those brothers and sisters and we do ask that you would provide for them in our absence. But for those who are present, may we take advantage of that gift that you've extended of that koinonia. That we confess our sins one to another, not unto salvation, but unto restoration. That God, you're ready today to restore and heal. So Lord, we ask this blessing as we spend this time in prayer. In Jesus' name.